Okay, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Waterloo branch and the Victoria branch of the Canadian International Council, please allow me to welcome you all to our program. My name is Laszlo Sirkani, and I serve uh, the Waterloo branch of the Canadian International Council as president. This afternoon, we have the privilege and honor to listen to distinguished professor, Dr. Thomas Homer Dixon and Ms. Nala Ayed, the host and producer of the popular CBC radio program, Ideas, as they discuss Dr. Homer Dixon's latest book entitled Commanding Hope, The Power We Have to Repair a World in Peril. In circumstances like the ones we found, find ourselves speaking and discussing hope is very much welcome. And so without further ado, I'd like to invite Ms. Ayed to take the floor. Ms. Ayed. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction and thank you for having us uh, with you today. And thank you especially for inviting us to have this conversation. Very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to Dr. Thomas Homer Dixon, also known as TAD. Uh, he holds a university research chair in the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo and is director of the Cascade Institute at Royal Roads University in Victoria, BC. And of course, worth mentioning that prior to Commanding Hope, he wrote The Upside of Down, Catastrophe, Creativity, and the Renewal of Civilization, and The Ingenuity Gap, uh, Can We Solve the Problems of the Future? So great to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, I'm delighted to be with you. So uh, I thought maybe a good place to begin uh, is, is what our possible end might be for uh, the planet that we live on before we get into the ideas around hope and how to garner it. Um, a sharp picture, please, of our present. For 40 years, you've studied the rapid, you know, destructive impact of, of our uh, existence on this planet, uh, the worsening economic insecurity, climate change, pandemics, the scarcity of natural resources, weakened government institutions, and how all of this can cascade into mass violence, terrorism, and even war. You've been nicknamed Doommeister, the doctor of doom, the prophet of doom, um, but it, it is our reality. So at the risk of cementing that reputation, I wonder if we could start by asking, you know, by the end of this century, what is the fate of our planet and our place in it if we do not take action now? I think the critical phrase there is if we do not take action. Uh, we still have a lot of choices in front of us, but the range of positive possibilities is narrowing because, uh, because the, the damage we're doing is increasing. And it's, it's destabilizing our societies. It's causing fear and anger. It's uh, widening economic gulfs between rich and poor. You know, climate damage around the planet is already costing trillions of dollars of, of lost productivity within the global economy. It's affecting people's food production. Uh, it's, it's contributing to famine, massive migrations of people. All of these things will get exponentially worse this century if we don't get climate change under, under control. It will, climate change will dominate every other problem we have on this planet eventually, and it will make all of the other problems worse. If we get to three or four degrees warming by the end of this century, which is where we will be under a, a business as usual scenario following our current trajectory of emissions, there isn't an ecosystem on the planet that will not be shredded by that. And I don't see any possibility for something like liberal democracy to survive either, the kinds of freedoms that we treasure so much. So the stakes are extraordinarily high now. And we will get to all those elements uh, within this hour, hopefully. But I did want to ask you briefly that, you know, that is a picture that has been with us for some time. What has been the failure, I suppose, of a lack of a better description, of catastrophism in, in, in motivating people to doing something? and to acting? I think that's a very good question. And you're right with all, with all the nicknames I've been called in the past. Uh, but frankly, I, I, you know, I, I don't enjoy painting that kind of picture of the future. It's where uh, scientific evidence and logic led me as I was analyzing the trajectory we're on. I think it doesn't work because, I mean, frankly, it terrifies people. And, and people's response to that kind of fear is to retreat often and, and to deny, to, to ignore the facts or think about something else. It's all perfectly human and, and normal behavior. Um, but you know, we developed fear as a species for a reason. It helps protect us. It can motivate us sometimes to make enormous changes. I think what's happened over the last little while are people are realizing as the evidence accumulates for climate change that 
the, the concerns that some of us have expressed for many decades and the pictures we've painted of the future are becoming real. And so uh, I don't seem to get called those things as much as I used to. Is there any irony in someone who's being called a doom meister writing a book about hope? Oh, absolutely. So, uh, I, you know, it's a bit of a Nixon to China moment, I suppose. You know, Nixon opened up China and it was regarded as a breakthrough moment in part because nobody thought a Republican would do that in the United States. And I don't think anybody expected somebody like me would write a book about positive possibilities in the future and about hope. Maybe I'll let other people judge. Maybe that gives me some more, some greater credibility in discussing the issue. Uh, but I did it fundamentally for my children uh, because uh, I have, uh, along with my wife, Sarah, we have two uh, still relatively young children, uh, Ben, who's 15, and Kate, who's 12. And they grew up essentially while I was writing this book over an eight year period. And uh, the deepest anguish I have in my heart is really that they will emerge as adults into a world and lose their hope and lose their sense of possibility as adults and for a positive future. And I realized that's just what I had to confront, that the net, this book had to paint a, a, a sort of chart as much as I could, a route forward through what seems to be a terribly difficult time. You acknowledge uh, in the book that the stories we tell ourselves about our future are key to how we motivate change. Yet you yourself acknowledge that the weight of evidence tells the following story, and I quote, we're all members of a failed species and we are destined to bear witness to the devastation of our planetary home and a violent unraveling of much we have accomplished. How would you want to tinker with that story? <laughs> well, okay, now let, let's, uh, let's be precise here. I, I, I say that's the story I fear my children will tell themselves. That's, that's the source of my anguish. I can't, I, I, it, it's almost, an impenetrable abyss for me to think about that possibility. I think as it would be for, me, for all parents. You call it the age of loss. The age of loss. Uh, and we're already seeing enormous loss around the planet if we are paying attention. So how would you change that story? How would you? So, so uh, I, I, it, it's going to take some pretty radical action at this point. And my book points towards the end. It, it presents a, a radical program for dramatic changes, especially in the way we see each other on this planet and the way we act together to try to change our institutions and our technologies. So for instance, we get our carbon dioxide emissions under control. I mean, very practical end. We have to, we have to radically and dramatically reduce our, our carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, but but that requires that we act differently as individuals and as communities and as countries and as a species. And uh, I think we can. We've been through, there have been periods in time in human history in the past where there have been in societies individually where people have made enormous changes very fast. And uh, and and so I, I actually think we're at a cusp moment in human history. This is a remarkably unusual time and there are possibilities that we can't see right now for positive change. So how would we tinker with it? I offer a number of suggestions towards the end of the book. The most, most of them relate to how we change the way we see the world and how we see other people and how we understand how they see the world so that we can work with them better to mobilize ourselves through political action to, to uh, uh, change the change the policies on climate, for example, and also so we can understand better those who are going to be our implacable opponents and be more strategic in dealing with them in the political contest that will come. I think it's going to be a very difficult time, though, and it's a time for some quite radical change. I don't think I think people are just beginning to realize how unusual this moment is looking around the world. And we will get a chance to get into a bit more detail about your prescription for, or your ideas about how to move forward. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to sort of meditate a little bit more on the idea of hope. And in your imagining of a worst case scenario, in your book, you point to um, the pop culture phenomenon of Mad Max, sort of the post-apocalyptic action hero of sorts who navigates the dystopian world, not, you know, a world that's not very far off in our future. Why do you draw specifically on this example uh, when you tell these stories? Well, uh... Of all of the widely understood pop cultural references, the one that seems to come closest to depicting the kind of dystopia uh, or brutal future that we might face, uh, given these increasing stresses and the unraveling, potential unraveling of our societies is the Mad Max 
series of movies. Um, I don't enjoy them very much. They're quite well done. Uh, but uh, there's an underlying tenor of uh, resource scarcity, underlying sort of principles of resource scarcity and uh, uh, survival of the fittest and uh, ethic and of course, enormous violence uh, that I think captures some key elements of what we might be evolving into. Um, I, I did that because, because I think people need some anchor points uh, that they can understand given their, their their own uh, reference references in the world, and this is a, a common one. I think it's and I think it's well done. I, it's uh, and you notice that lots of people use it. Lots of people talk about Mad Max futures. It's and, true. And what's what's the value in doing that? Do you think sort of resort looking at fictional uh, depictions of what our future might be like? Well, I think it it uh, gives us a contrast point. It gives us a you know, we do not want to go there. So, uh, uh, it, and, and helps motivate us to find some alternative, some other possibility. Uh, one of the things I point out about hope is that it's, it's most powerful when it has an object, when it has a vision of the future. We'll probably talk about that in a bit. And, uh, uh, and, and but uh, you need to contrast that vision with the alternative to be really motivating. So, uh, and I actually think that uh, something resembling what I would call a Mad Max worldview is already coalescing in many corners of the world. Uh, and, and, and we need to recognize that, put a name on it because it's an enormous threat to us. Speaking of worldviews, uh, we'll get to that also in a minute, but I, I wanted to get out of sort of this, the, the bigger picture and kind of zoom in on something that's a lot more personal for you. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell me about your favorite beach uh, on Vancouver Island and how it changed over the decades um, from the time you were a child until you became an adult, a father. Yes, so uh, my favorite beach is, uh, is uh, not far from Jordan River on the southwestern Vancouver Island. And uh, uh, I've been going there for 50 odd years, 50, 60 years since I was a child here. Uh, <clears throat> I've taken my children there frequently and uh, it's small, hardly anybody knows about it. You have to kind of hack your way through the woods to get down to it, down a very steep cliff, somewhat dangerous cliff, but it's a magical place. I've camped there many times. And, uh, and, and uh, it looks out across the Strait of Juan de Fuca and uh, at the Olympic Mountains in Washington State. And since I've been going there for a long time, I've been able to chart or recognize the changes in, in, in the beach, as well as the surrounding, the surrounding uh, landscape. Um, uh, sea levels haven't risen enough yet for that to be noticeable, but uh, storms are bigger, and th that has changed the, the the sort of configuration of the beach, the sand and the gravel on the beach. Um, one of the really striking things is all the starfish have disappeared uh, in the last ten years or so. Uh, actually, probably starting in the mid mid two thousands. And we think that it had something to do with uh, increasing sea temperatures that made starfish more vulnerable to uh, particular kinds of viruses and infections. So again, a combination of factors, but one of which is, and the viruses might have always been there, but the, but the higher sea level, or higher sea temperatures made, uh, made the organisms more vulnerable to those viruses. So human beings have had a contribution, made a major contribution to that. And, and starfish have disappeared almost entirely all the way down the west coast of North America. There have been a few places where they've recovered and people will point to that. But you know, when I was a kid, these beaches were festooned with, with sea stars uh, of all colors, purple and brown and orange. And it was magical just watching them. And my children, as they were, when they were young, because they didn't completely disappear until about 2015, 2016, they saw them but now they're gone. And that's an extraordinary loss. Uh, the forest surrounding the beach is also under enormous stress. We've had a series of very bad droughts here on Vancouver Island over the last, uh, last number of years, starting in 2015, and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of trees in Southern Vancouver Island, uh, especially the Western red cedar and uh, balsam fir, or what's called now the grand fir, are, are, have died or are dying. You can see their carcasses across the landscape and, and around the beach, you can see them all uh, bereft of their needles, uh, waiting to topple over in future storms. So these changes are already quite dramatic for those who are paying attention. 
Uh, and uh, and of course, you know, those of us on Vancouver Island who live and love live in and love the forest are desperately concerned that we're going to start to see the kind of fires that have been witnessed in interior of British Columbia or in Washington State and Oregon this past summer. Because if the landscape dries, these forests will burn. Uh, there's no question about that. It's an almost inescapable part of our future. So turning to the question of hope, uh, you distinguish between two kinds of hope. There's the hope that, and then there's the hope to. Uh, why is it important to you to make that distinction? Hope has a bit of a bad rap at the moment in uh, popular discourse. Uh, it's, it's, it's some people regard it as kind of a passive emotion, as perhaps conducive to wishful thinking because it encourages us to bend the probabilities in our minds for the positive future we hope will happen. And, and hope that, that kind of locution, I hope that, for instance, the, the, the planet's climate won't warm more than 1.5 degrees, or I hope that it will be sunny tomorrow. I hope that I, I win a million dollars in a lottery. In each case, that's a very passive, uh, passive use of the notion of hope. You're sitting back and you're, 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 you're hoping simply that something will come to pass. Whereas the hope to locu locution is much more, uh, much more active. You're, at, you're an agent automatically. I hope to, and then to is always followed by a verb. I hope to help stop global warming. I, I hope to plant my garden tomorrow. I hope to make my children's lives safer. And in each case, you're saying, you're saying that you're going to be an agent in the process. You don't know whether it's gonna to come to pass. And that's a key thing about hope. There's always an uncertainty surrounding it. That's that's what, in some ways, makes the ideas, the emotions, so powerful. But you feel that you can play a role in 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 bending the probabilities, in shifting in in shifting them in your favor, increasing the chances that that good possibility will happen. So the kind of hope that I advocate in the book that I argue for, which I call commanding hope, is very much a hope to kind of hope, uh, and I, I make that very clear at one point in the book. You're right that that hope does have kind of a, a bad rep in the popular sort of discourse. But but one person who brought it to the fore, and who you talk about quite a bit in your book, is uh, former U.S. President Barack Obama, uh, and he famously referred to what he called the audacity of hope. What do you think of how he defined hope in this speech that he delivered uh, in 2004 at the at the Democrat, Democratic National Convention? Well, it was when he made his first national mark and, and extraordinary speech. And then of course, again, in his acceptance speech, the Democratic National Convention in 2008. And he anchored much of his, his, his uh, 2008 campaign in this notion of hope, very powerful idea. I argue in the book though, that it was a, a hope, uh, it may have been an agential hope in the sense of the hope to kind of hope, but it still didn't have a very, clear idea of the of of the future that he wanted to build he left that in some sense rather vague for people to fill in of course it was anchored in some broad principles that he had that that people within for instance the democratic party and the progressives in the united states generally adhere to but uh but it it was uh and it i think it suffered uh in some respects from uh a particular vulnerability that some notions of hope have right now. And that was a kind of vagueness. And it was easy ultimately to ridicule as Sarah Palin did famously in 2011, where she asked a bunch of Republicans in a big speech, she said, you know, so how's that hopey changey thing doing for you? You know, and, and uh, we need to make, I argue we need to make hope more muscular. We need to make it more specific and kind of tuned to the particular challenges that we face. Uh, we can, in a sense, command it. We can we can make it do our bidding psychologically, so that it becomes a very powerful motivation and emotion for us to to respond to these difficult times we're facing. I think Obama's hope was a good hope for the time, but I'm not sure that it's really up to up to the demands that we face now in the world. If we go back further in time, Tad, and, and look at the notion of hope, it, it is something that philosophers have grappled with all throughout the ages. Um, the, Stoic, the Stoics, for example, 
don't have much time for hope. They say that it's a distraction, you know, the higher your hope, the further you fall. What do you make of that? Well, I have a, I, I have a, quite a bit of time for Stoic philosophy, but I would part company on this particular, particular issue. Um, there's a bit of conversation and discussion in, in the literature that I've read about whether the, the Stoics actually abandoned hope entirely. They were skeptical about it. But one of the things that psychologists are telling us now, uh, positive psychologists in particular, and I talk about positive psychology quite a bit in the book, is that it's actually very hard to persevere in the absence of hope. It doesn't matter how, how el elaborate your Stoic philosophy is. My guess is that even Marcus Aurelius, you know, one of the great, greatest uh, Stoic philosophers and emperor, of course, I, I, that, that there was some hope operating in his mind somewhere there. Uh, I, I, think, I think the Stoic philosophy was an attempt to, in a sense, put it in its place and prevent it from becoming, uh, motivating the kind of wishful thinking that hope often does that actually weakens us, makes us less engaged with our challenges, less likely to respond to them effectively. Well, what um, makes you think that it was uh, operating in the back of Marcus Aurelius's mind? Oh, simply that I, and, and maybe this is just personal introspection on my part. I don't know where I would be <laughs> if I had no hope. You know, when my children are starting to recognize the seriousness of the situation in the world and they are learning on, about, about climate change and what the world might be like, how do we respond to them as parents? We, 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 we talk about what they can do. We can say, well, these are the things you can do to respond. These are your possibilities as, we don't use this terminology, but as agents to respond to this problem. There, there, there can be positive outcomes for you. That's, that's in, reinforcing or trying to protect their hope. And that's what I realized in 2016. I've been working on this book since 2012 started it twice and hadn't worked. And then in 2016, I realized that, that it really had to be about protecting my children's hope. Uh, and so, you know, in the case of the Stoics, I mean, maybe their brains just operate a lot differently from mine, you know, in their in deepest psychology. But I think there has to be some, even for those who are very critical of hope and want to jettison it, and there are a number of modern commentators who, who do, I, I think that it, it's almost paralytic to eliminate it entirely from your from your uh, psychology. So that's that's why I think the Stoics probably had a little reservoir of hope somewhere in the back of their heads. When you look back even further, um, there have been times where it's been seen kind of like a, a double-edged a double -edged sword, just which you've talked about in your in your book. If you could kind of en enlighten us a little bit on the lessons that we can that can be gleaned from the gr the Greek myth of Pandora. Uh, as recounted by the Greek poet Hesiod around 700 BC. Right, hope. right. So of course, every, just about everybody's familiar with this story. Uh, uh, Zeus was angry with man for uh, getting access to fire. And so he he created the beautiful and beguiling woman Pandora. It's an enormously misogynistic story, you know, uh, to uh, uh, and and sent Pandora to Earth to to man with with a jar. It was mistranslated. The, the Greek word for jar was mistranslated by the Dutch uh, Renaissance uh, philosopher Erasmus as box. So it's come down to us as Pandora's box. But it was really Pandora's jar, and it was full of all kinds of of. Uh, is closed and it was, but then inside it were all kinds of evil things like death and uh, sickness and despair. And, uh, and she opened it and out flew all of this stuff, all these, these, these afflictions that were going to uh, affect man and humanity for eternity. Uh, but hope, which was a little elf-like spirit, a daemon uh, called uh, Elspis, Elp, Elpsis, to get that right, Elpsis, uh, uh, got uh, caught on the lip of the of the jar and didn't escape. And then and then the uh, uh, Pandora shut the top and trapped trapped hope inside the jar. So there's some question about whether the the story that Hesiod was telling, what position it was taking or Hesiod was taking with respect to hope. Uh, is the fact that it wasn't released with the other afflictions uh, a good thing? Uh, because uh, 
uh, now humanity is able to hold on to it. And it, it uh, is ambiguous. It's not yeah, really clear yeah. whether it's hope is evil or whether we deserve right. to have hope. And, and, and the other, you know, the other possibility is that it's now in the box and it's ever forever going to tempt us and and distract and distract us and and by by providing us with this sense of possibility, make us unhappy about the lot that we have. So in in that respect, the Greeks clearly had a very uh, complex understanding of hope and they were deeply ambivalent about it and uh, uh, and I think that has as I point out in the book that ambivalence about hope uh, has gone through history right up to the present day I do a little exercise I take uh, Bartlett's familiar quotations a hard copy I've had for many decades and I open it up and, I, and there are hundreds and hundreds of quotations with hope using hope in one way or the other. And I selected 34 that I thought were particularly pertinent and useful. And they split just about down the middle between those that had a very negative perception of hope and those that had a very positive perception. So this, this ambivalence is with us. And I think it's actually an important part of why hope is so powerful. It's why it's so evocative for us because we don't really know where to place it. We don't know whether it's in the box or out of the box. Mm. That's a, a really vivid way to describe what, what it's like today, for sure. I, I wonder if we could go back to the the discussion we started about where hope might play a role in politics. And you mentioned, you know, Sarah Palin uh, and Obama. Is there a role, or what role can hope play in the realm of, of practical political change? If it is, as you say, sometimes greeted as a hopey, hopey, changey thing, as Sarah Palin did. Well, I don't think it has to be be. Uh vaguely defined and, and that's you know in a sense the major project of the book is to is to provide a a framing for a more specific uh and precisely defined notion of hope uh and make that a project i i i, I see no reason why that couldn't something like that couldn't become part of our larger political and public policy discussions when the the notion of hope is evoked i noticed that joe biden in his acceptance speech at the online a virtual Democratic National Convention used the notion of hope repeatedly in his in his speech. I, I think it's a an idea that comes very easily to those of a progressive political persuasion. Uh, I, I think it can be sometimes uh, too vaguely stated, but it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, it doesn't come so easily to to those of a more um, frankly Trumpian political persuasion. Uh, the emotions that uh, those kinds of leaders draw on tend to be emotions of fear and anger. It sets up a very sharp contrast between different possibilities for the future. Uh, so uh, I, I, I would encourage people to, to uh, refer to hope and use hope and make it part of their lives and make it part of our public conversations and, and political conversations. Uh, but it needs to be, you need to back it up with some substance. You know, okay, what do I mean by this? What future possibilities am I talking about? Uh, and, you know, as I argue all the way through the book, it has to be grounded in a realistic understanding of the situation we face, what I call honest, honest hope. Someone you mentioned uh, and others mentioned quite often when we talk about hope in, in political discussions and discussions about the future is Greta Thunberg. Uh, I wonder if, if you could speak to what it is about her that resonates with your understanding of hope. Well, I think she's a remarkable present day instantiation, if you want to use that fancy word, of, of uh, all the characteristics or components of what I call commanding hope. It has three components, uh, honest hope, astute hope, and powerful hope. And Greta Thunberg uh, seems, to be, seems to have a, a notion of hope motivating her that has all of those characteristics. She has a brutally realistic, scientifically grounded, and honest understanding of the situation we face and how serious this climate change problem is. Uh, so that's honest hope. She has a very astute understanding of, of how other people are, are seeing the world and seeing the issue and how they may or may not be motivated to change. She has, she's extraordinarily strategically smart in, in her political activities to mobilize people around the world. So that's part of what I call astute hope. And then she has a very clear moral vision of where she wants to go, of what kind of future we should have that object of her hope. And because of that, her hope is very powerful. She has a, she makes a deep moral commitment to stopping this problem and to protecting children. And, uh, and, and uh, that gives her, gives her uh, ambition and agency 
uh, and psychological force. And so, so her her conception of hope, and I haven't interviewed her. I just read what she's written and watched her speak. But my impression is that her conception of hope is very close to what I call commanding hope. And uh, there are other cases where it's been exhibited in the world many times too. And I talk about some of those. I'm curious how much you think her conception of hope actually plays a role in the kinds of abuse that she receives from people who are detractors of Greta Thunberg. Mm, that's a very interesting question. Well, there are all kinds of reasons why she receives abuse. How much of it do you think has to do with her hopefulness? It, it, there may be a, a component there. I, I think. Um, I think. I think what really angers people is that her moral status or her moral arguments are, I would say, almost unassailable. She's saying basically to adults around the world and to parents, your basic job as parents is to take care of us, and you haven't done that, and that's disgrace, right? That's a moral disgrace. Uh, that That is just such a pointed, sharp end argument that cuts to the core of every of every parent or adult who cares about children that uh, that I think I think that a lot of people just have those those who who don't think climate change or don't want to think climate change is a problem uh, just have to block it out because it's enormously threatening. I, I I'd have to think a bit more about whether whether it's her hope that, is angering people. She certainly, she certainly has a vision of the future, and it's a vision of the future that um, uh, a lot of folks, frankly, on the right of the political spectrum, would have some trouble fitting into. It's, it's a, it's a, 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 uh, uh, a vision of the future with, with, with uh, radically different technologies, of course, but also radically different power relations in our societies. Uh, more socially democratic, uh, uh, much narrower gaps between rich and poor, much more progressive taxation, uh, shifting of resources, huge resources from wealthy individuals and wealthy societies to poor individuals and poorer societies around the world. I mean, frankly, the only way we're going to deal with climate change is to is to move a lot of resources around. And so the kind of future she represents is something that is uh, and that's a part of her hope, I would say, uh, her object of her hope uh, is kind of anathema to a lot of a lot of folks at the conservative end, of, uh, more right wing end of the political spectrum. And I, I'm sure that's that's a big part of why she makes people so angry. She seems to embody kind of the your prescription of the need for all of us to shift our stories from sort of the passive question of what story should I tell my children to the story, what can I do to help humanity as, as a whole. I wonder if you could speak to that. How, how is it that we are going to shift that story? How do we do that? Well, she embodies it because as one individual, she's changed the world. And I talk about somebody else in the book, uh, a, a housewife by the name of Stephanie May in the 1950s who single-handedly mobilized mothers around the world to stop, to stop the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. And and uh, uh, and and there are these stories, and Greta Thunberg is a very good one, a contemporary story of somebody who who uh, just decided to do something and just found, found the situation really repugnant, outrageous. You know, and the other part of what I find really interesting about Greta Thunberg's story is that uh, if somebody had said in 2016 or even 2017, because I think she started her her campaign in 2018. Let's say 2017, somebody had said, you know, a girl of 15 is going to sit on the steps of the Swedish parliament building with her school backpack and a little sign saying climate strike in Swedish. And she's going to mobilize a global movement of tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people to stop climate change and to get action on climate change. And we would have said, that's a ridiculous idea. That's never going to happen. And yet that possibility was just across the boundary in what complexity scientists call the adjacent possible. It was invisible to us at the time, but Greta Thunberg brought it into the, one, into the realm of possibility. And I think that's an exciting, exciting thing for us to recognize. There may be countless uh, possibilities for radical change sitting, sitting just across the boundary in the, in the invisible, in the adjacent possible. And, we may have opportunities to make those real, but we don't know they're there yet. I think Greta Thunberg 
reminds us of what of of how significant movements can develop very quickly around the world. And we may be on the cusp of many of those now. I mean, some of them may be good from our perspective or my perspective, some of them may be bad, but they're but we may not even imagine exactly how they would manifest themselves yet. Uh, and, what is, and that and that, that's well, that's a source of hope for me because that uncertainty about what the possibilities are means that we can never throw up we should never throw up our hands and say and say it's all hopeless now because we don't understand the possibilities in the future well enough to be able to say that yet. I was just curious as a follow up in, in terms of whether there's a shortcut, whether there's a, an easy way for the rest of us who aren't Greta Thunberg to understand how it is you shift your lens from a story that involves you and your family to one that worries about the world. I tell my, I tell my students, for instance, and I think this is true for everybody, that it doesn't matter what your walk of life is. It doesn't matter what you're doing. There's a role to play on the climate change problem. And you know, the book is not exclusively about climate change. It's about a whole range of issues that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, but, uh, but it doesn't matter whether you're an artist, an accountant, a construction worker, uh, an engineer, a lawyer, uh, a medical professional. Uh, there, there are things to do. There are things for everybody to do. And they can be small. I mean, it certainly matters to change our own lifestyles and to adjust our own, own lifestyles. We've worked on it hard within our family and probably cut our carbon output by over half. And, it, and, 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 and those can be sort of everyday changes in consumption and behavior. And then some of them can be bigger. Some of them can involve learning about the issue and being prepared to engage with people on it, to have conversations around the dinner table or at a political meeting or to get involved in a political movement. But I wouldn't put it past everybody to get that that they have within within their capacity the possibility of of organizing uh, real change. I don't. I, Greta Thunberg. I mean, she's a remarkable young woman. Stephanie May was a remarkable woman. But just about everybody is remarkable in their own respects and can do remarkable things when they set their minds to it. I, that's something I really believe. Again, you know, from a complex systems point of view, what we know is that sometimes in these extraordinarily complex social systems, small things can make a huge difference to outcomes. And you don't really know in advance what small things will matter. Maybe the thing, maybe, maybe the thing that Joe or Susan or Ahmed does tomorrow is going to make all the difference. We don't know. And that's, again, another reason for hope uh, because uh, those possibilities are still open to us. I, I want to talk to you just briefly about uh, one of the detours you take in your or your book um, that have to do with storytelling and the stories that we tell ourselves, uh, and that's to the fantasy land as told by J.R.R. Tolkien in the Lord of the uh, the Rings trilogy. You say that a deep dive into the Tolkien classic fantasy might seem out of place in a somber book about hope, but clearly there's a reason it's there. Can you first just give us a brief synopsis of, uh, of the plot that concerned uh, your reference there? For all of the three people in the world who haven't seen the movies. <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah. which part is it that concerned you and, and found relevance in your book? Well, you know, uh, I, I, I was not a fan of Tolkien and I had never actually read the books and I'd seen some of the movies and not, not been terribly engaged with them. But I started to read them to Ben when he was eight, and I was I was uh, enthralled actually by the time I got about fifty pages in. So the story, the plot line, uh, there there is a, a land or, or a, a a magical place called Middle Earth, uh, and it's inhabited by various races of beings, uh, men and hobbits and elves and, and dwarves. Uh, and also, there's a very powerful lord, Lord Sauron, who uh, uh, dominates the eastern reaches in an area of Middle Earth called Mordor. And he is after uh, a ring that, if he gets access to it, it's going to allow him ultimate power to dominate all of Middle Earth and extend a, a reign of terror basically across the entire, the entire, entire land. And uh, the ring happens to be in the possession of a mild-mannered hobbit by the name of Frodo. And uh, the story is really about how the ring is destroyed and how the very members of the various races uh, in Middle-earth come together to figure out how to make this happen. The, the ring has to be carried into Mordor uh, past 
uh, ranks and ranks of uh, formidable, ugly creatures who are amazingly violent and has to be carried up the slopes of Mount Doom, which is a volcano, and thrown into the fires of Mount Doom. It seems like it's a completely impossible task. And what I realized when, uh, when uh, I was reading the book to Ben is that the, it's really an extended meditation on uh, what one should do if things look absolutely hopeless and how one should respond. Not, not so much in, in the specific logistics of uh, the, that the, the Fellowship of the Ring, the ultimate alliance uh, pursued to get the ring to Mount Doom, but more in, in the psychological response the book is very. The books, the three volumes, are very psychological. They're very. There's a lot of conversation about how people are thinking and feeling, and thinking and feeling about each other, and seeing their enemies, and uh, and and they're constantly struggling with despair. They're constantly struggling with the whether they should just throw up their hands and walk away. And so it's a it's a wonderful uh, vehicle for talking about some aspects of hope. Uh, and Tolkien, Tolkien was brilliant. I mean, he 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 wrote the, the fantasy, but it's it's deeply grounded in Celtic, and Celtic myth and Germanic and Norse myth. And he created a whole ontology, a whole world of cosmology of beings and of language. And uh, he understood, actually, it turns out when I dug into it, he understood the issues surrounding hope very intimately. Is there an analogy there to climate change that you wanted to get at as well? Yeah, absolutely. Although the analogy, as I point out in the book, is a little bit imperfect because, because uh, for, for the Fellowship of the Ring, the Alliance, it was very clear what had to be done. It seemed impossible, but you had to get the ring to Mount Doom and throw it in the fires of Mount Doom. Uh, and, and it was also clear... So there was a single goal, and it was also clear that the only way that goal could be accomplished was to bring everybody together. The people had to collaborate. So it became what social psychologists call a superordinate goal, an overarching goal that requires collaboration to be achieved. Uh, the other thing that's important is that it's a classic war scenario where you have an external enemy. And you can, you, Sauron is, is uh, personified uh, throughout the books, uh, personified evil. And uh, the problem with climate change is it's not clear where the enemy is. You know, to quote uh, Walt Kelly and, and uh, his famous cartoon strip character Pogo, we have seen the enemy and he is us. We are all contributors in some respect, some more than others, but we're all contributors to the problem of climate change. The enemy is, is, uh, is our institutions, our technologies, uh, but it's also the way we consume and even our basic attitudes towards, for instance, the good life and uh, how much we're prepared to collaborate and cooperate with each, each other to solve the problem. So, so it's inside us and, and it's, there's no external focus. And so far also, we haven't turned climate change into the kind of superordinate goal it should be that draws us together. Instead, it's driving us apart. And that's, uh, uh, and that's uh, very scary. I, I talk in the book about how we can convert the problem into something resembling more of the kind of problem that the Fellowship of the Ring encountered in, in The Lord of the Rings, make it a more of a superordinate goal that will bring us together instead of tearing us apart. Uh, this is a, a critical challenge we face, and especially if we're going to have hopeful, uh, a sense of hope about the future. One last question about the Lord of the Rings. There are two kinds of hope that work together in, in the story. There's Amdir, a hope that, that involves an expectation of good, which though uncertain has some foundation in what is known. And this is a hope that's grounded in knowledge and reason. And then there's Estelle, a deep hope born of trust or faith that things will turn out well. How do those two kinds of hope work together? So it seems that Tolkien put most of his faith in Amdir. So he doesn't actually talk about these in the Lord of the Rings itself. Uh, there were some uh, uh, dialogues that were published by his son posthumously uh, in which he has a dialogue in part between an elf king and an old woman about, about hope and they go back and forth about what hope is. And that's where Tolkien lays out his philosophy of hope. 
And it appears, if you look at the Lord of the Rings, at least my reading the Lord of the Rings, is that uh, this Amder, which is a hope that has a, an object, it sees a possible vision of the future, it's grounded in evidence, it's grounded in an assessment of what the possibilities are and, and makes choices between pathways going forward to reach that positive future. And that's very much similar to what I would call commanding hope. Uh, that Amder is the hope that he invests most of his, his faith in within Lord of the Rings, because that's what, frankly, that's what uh, the Fellowship of the Ring is doing most of the time. They're, they're, they're undergoing those kinds of calculations and judgments all the time. Uh, but when, when, when Amder seems to be blocked, then Estil comes to the fore. Estil is a, a more objectless hope. It's a hope that, it, that has, has, it, it has this broader sense that things will probably turn out if we just, if we just uh, leave things to their own devices. Maybe not quite like that, but there's the possibility of a good future, uh, but we don't really know what it is. We don't really know what that future looks like and we don't know how to get there. So it's kind of a backstop. I see it as a kind of a backstop version of hope. And, uh, and, and it seems that Tolkien is arguing that, that in very difficult times, we need to move back and forth between the two. That most of the time we exercise amder, that's our notion of hope. And we have a sense for where we're going and we have a strategy for getting there, even though the probabilities might be low. But when all, everything seems to be blocked, we always can fall back to Estel. And, and for me, the Estel uh, resonates very strongly with what I was saying about uh, the possibilities that reside in complexity. The, the, the uncertainty around that, 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 that good things are not possible. I'm sorry, I lost you there briefly, Tad. Um, do you want to just repeat your last thought in case others did too? Yes. So, uh, so Tolkien seemed to be uh, suggesting that when Amdir is blocked, when we we don't have evidence for believing that there's a good possibility in front of us, that uh, that we fall back to Estel. It's kind of a backstop. And is that is that where we are at? Do you think? Do you think no, I don't think so. I think okay. I think we actually have. We have uh, many avenues forward that we can we can we can depict a future, a clear a clear possibility, a positive future, and we can chart a pathway and marshal evidence for how we get there. Now, the probabilities, you know, hope does not have to be grounded in confidence that we're going to get there in a say more than a 50 50 percent probability. It can be grounded in a relatively small probability, twenty percent, ten percent, but we still have a sense for where we want to go. And, and, and how to do it based on the evidence we have. That's AMDR. But if, if, if we don't have that evidence, just to repeat the point that I was making when I was cut off, if we don't have that evidence, we can still, perhaps I would say, and I argue, we can have hope in, in the, uh, that resides in the uncertainty surrounding us, the possibilities that could, that could arise simply because we don't understand the systems around us well enough to know that nothing good is possible, that there may be good things there that we can't see yet that are in that across the boundary of the adjacent possible, as I was saying before. We're now living through a time, as you point out several times, of, of quite a bit of polarization, um, authoritarian style populist politicians around the world getting growing support in Brazil, Turkey, the United States. H how would you describe this polarization in terms of our inability to see each other's worldviews in your words, how would you describe that? Okay, so I've lost you here. Okay. Just hold on. Do you want me to, can you see me? Yeah, now you're back. I got okay. the question. I got okay, the question. Good. It seems my internet Please. is a bit unstable, so. But Sorry, the recording, we'll keep trying. Yeah, the recording's working well. Uh, um, polarization, so. I think the increasingly dominant emotion in our world is fear. And the fear causes people to retreat to verities, to things that they, they that ideas and attitudes and norms, uh, commitments to things that are true that have always anchored their lives. So uh, their basic worldview commitments, uh, they could be religious, 
They could be things that they learned within their families and, uh, and, and become less tolerant of those who think differently. Uh, it's very easy to understand. Lots of documentation and research within social psychology and within political science and other disciplines, how, how fear encourages people to retreat into their identity groups and, uh, and hunker down and reinforce their fundamental commitments to value to certain values, uh, and and this and, and this is exacerbated, of course, by the social media in our world that uh, that encourage groups to develop a kind of echo chambers to talk only to themselves, not to that, those who disagree with them, who have whole different points of view, and so within these different epistemic worlds, you could say, uh, people have their own truths, their own knowledge systems, they have their own experts, they have their own scientific journals, they have their own sources of evidence. And uh, the result is you have, you have uh, a breakdown of the basic conversation that's essential for a democratic society to function. Uh, the agora, you could say, as the Greeks would call it, where, where you come together and work out your, your disputes and your differences uh, in a common space. And you have to have some basic understandings, some shared understandings of the world for that to happen. And those understandings are breaking down, which is extraordinarily dangerous if we're going to try to address problems like climate change. I mean, there are still lots of people in the world who don't even think it's happening. Just like there are lots of people in the world who think the coronavirus is, is just a hoax, despite what? the fact, you know, that despite the fact that it's endemic around the planet now. What is the first step, Tad, to finding kind of practical hope when it seems harder for people to engage with those outside their so-called political camps as, as we stand today? What's the first step? I would argue that the first step is having a much better understanding of how uh, we as individuals inside our own heads see the world and what our basic value commitments are. I spend a lot of time unpacking my own in the book. Uh, as an example of how we can do this, running various thought experiments. And then we need to apply that exercise as best we can to other people too. One of the things we've found in our research, which is quite interesting at the University of Waterloo, is that uh, people's perceptions of the attitudes and perspectives of their opponents are usually pretty inaccurate. They, they, you can, we can have uh, partial and very stereotypical and sometimes simply wrong perceptions of how the people we disagree with look at the world. So we're not gonna be very effective in either building bridges to those people, or frankly, even having any kind of conversation or working around them in any kind of political contest unless we understand how they see the world. So I provide some tools in the book, like some very practical tools uh, that anybody can use to get a better handle on some of these attitudes. This is a, a kind of worldview interpretation and worldview engineering, trying to get inside people's perspectives and understand how they work. That's a, that's, a, that's a starting point, I think. If not for ameliorating this polarization, uh, and just understanding where it's coming from. And we tend to dismiss people who we disagree with as either stupid or deceitful. It's, it's, it, it, we all do it. But when you really spend time talking with most people we disagree with strongly over an issue like climate change, you find out they're neither stupid nor deceitful. Uh, and, and that's always a bit bewildering. And, and the first thing that we can do is, is, is recognize that and understand how those people are seeing us and seeing the world around them. Can we talk about some of those models that you're that you are proposing this uh, perhaps starting with the complexity lens. This is something you're proposing to help us see other people's worldviews. So all of my work is grounded in complexity science. It has been for many decades. It's a, a body of thinking quite disparate around the world, but basically it looks at, uh, at uh, systems that have lots of components. They can be economies, they can be ecological systems, it can be the climate, it can be belief systems in people's heads, lots of components in a belief system, you have lots of concepts that are linked together in, in enormously complex ways. And all complex systems have the, have the possibility of changing their behavior very suddenly, sometimes in what appears to be from, from very small causes can cause very large differences or shifts in the behavior of a complex system. They have this capacity to flip from one equilibrium or one stable state to another. 
and uh, uh, and and so I put some hope in the possibility that we may be at the cusp of that kind of shift uh, in the future. That we could there could be the possible for some fairly radical worldview change around the world. Um, and uh, one of the ways I approach this is through something called the state space model, which is basically a list of questions that I would argue uh, every political ideology or political worldview needs to answer about the world, uh, such as, you know, uh, is change a good thing or not? Do we, uh, do we look for our positive vision or our hope towards the future or towards the past? Our uh, values, the values we hold, the moral values we hold, relative and contextual, or are they absolute and universal? Uh, to what extent do, do people have free will to determine their fate? Or is their fate largely determined by uh, the structure of, of the circumstances around them? And here's a big one, the one that I, I keep coming back to. To what extent is our society divided into fundamentally dis dis different groups that are essentially different from each other. Now, when you look at uh, various political ideologies and political worldviews, you find that their answers to these questions are quite different. Uh, and you can you can create what's called a state space where you treat each one of the uh, each one of these questions as kind of a dimension in the state space. Uh, like you'd have, say, just two positions on the dimension. You can answer the question at one extreme or at the other extreme. But I, in, in my model, I provide a continuum of answers for a question, such as the free will versus determinism question. People usually don't fall at one extreme or the other. They're somewhere in the middle. And uh, then you there are 15 of these questions, and you create what mathematicians call a high dimensional state space. It doesn't have to be so fancy. The bottom line is I provide a table of the questions in the book, and anybody can go through uh, and answer them and find out where they sit. And you can find out where other people sit by getting them to answer the questions or estimating what you think their answers would be. And it's very revealing. I contrast, uh, I contrast the Mad Max worldview and perspective on the future with uh, Stephanie May's perspective on the future, which is also quite close, I think, probably to Greta Thunberg's perspective on the future. And it's like night and day. I mean, you can see dramatic differences. This state space model allows us to see uh, whether two perspectives are close enough to each other that they might be reconciled or whether they're so far apart, they, they might be impossible to reconcile. And here's another thing that's really cool about this perspective is that there may be within that extraordinarily large range of possibilities inside the state space, there may be perspectives that we've never explored before. New worldviews sitting inside what I call the mindscape defined by that, by those questions that would help us survive together and prosper together better on this planet that we've never identified before. And that's again, a source of real hope. Um, we tend to get trapped in very narrow perspectives instead of two or three political ideologies in our societies and uh, cycle between them and not see the other possibilities out there. So the, the state space model is intended to try to open up those possibilities for people and get us from imagining new things. There's also something called the cognitive effective maps, which is something invented by philosopher uh, and cognitive scientist Paul Taggart. Can you tell us about that as well? Yes. So Paul is a close colleague of mine at the University of Waterloo, one of the actually marvelous things about moving to the University of Waterloo in 2008 was a chance to work with Paul. And he uh, initially developed cognitive effective maps, or we call them CAMs, C-A-M. And uh, I show people how to do them in the book. Uh, they, they are basically concept maps or mind maps where you take a bunch of concepts related to something like climate change. You think about climate change and then you think immediately about the other concepts you'd associate with climate change. But before you do anything else at that point, you do something which is different from any other kind of mind map. You identify whether the, each one of those concepts has a positive or a negative emotional loading for you, or what psychologists would call emotional valence. Do you feel good about it? Do you feel good about the thing referred to by that concept or bad about it? So climate change, you might feel bad about it and you think that it's a bad thing. And so you surround that concept with a hexagon. If you've got color, you put it inside a red hexagon. Uh, if you think that you, you like Greta Thunberg and she's in your mind map about climate change, your CAM, 
about climate change, you, you, you surround Greta Thunberg with a green oval. And then the last step is you connect all the concepts in your CAM together with, uh, with links, either dotted or dashed, depending on whether the concepts are fundamentally opposed or, or congruent with each other. And the result is you build a, you build a kind of an emotional, uh, emotional concept map that reveals much more about how one thinks of the world and how he feels the world through one's emotions than a, a regular uh, mind map would do. And you can do this for other people too. And the, and the two approaches, the cognitive effective mapping and the state space uh, can be used uh, very powerfully together. And I talk about how you can do that in the book to, to really, the, the, the cognitive effective maps are kind of a micro map of how a particular person or group might see the details of their situation. Whereas the state space model allows you to see, see uh, in, a, in a large scale, how far you are from other perspectives uh, in, in, in a, and what the possibilities for, are for change within this larger space of, of political ideologies. So, you know, these two tools I introduce uh, as, as ways of showing people how they can take their first steps along that hopeful road of worldview change with them inside their own minds and potentially with other people uh, and, and be more effective in, in their political projects of uh, stopping problems like climate change. It's uh, difficult to conceive um, just from afar how that would work on a, on a practical level. I wonder if I apply this question to the explanations you just provided to precisely how it is that we can scale this type of thinking to solving some of the large problems that we have. How do we engage as people of this earth to command hope as you want for our future? Well, to drill down on particular on this issue of worldview change, which is critical to my, my hopeful project. Uh, uh, I, I think that um, when you look around the world, people are getting trapped in, in ideological, uh, fairly narrow ideological zones, or what complexity folks would call basins of attraction. And they, are, they aren't able to see beyond very far. And the anger is rising. Those basins are getting deeper. And that's a very dangerous situation. And so my grand project with this book is to take this, the, these tools and this information that we've learned through our research and through other social psychologists and social scientists have learned through their research and make it as widely available as possible. So we've loaded onto the, onto the internet uh, a tool that can be used by anybody to do cognitive effective mapping. And everybody who does it is struck by how revealing it is. I get people coming back to me and saying, wow, now I understand why my relationship is breaking down a lot better than I did before. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, you know, we're in the process of doing uh, research to, sh to explore, for instance, how these tools can be used to reduce conflict between groups. But it's a bit like our situation with the pandemic. You want to try, try to move the treatments and the vaccines out as quickly as possible because the situation is so urgent. So in the case of this book, I thought these are important enough ideas, I think, that they, could, they deserve to see the broader light of day now. I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, frankly, I see Commanding Hope as kind of a uh, field manual for uh, a green political revolution, not a violent revolution. But a but a, a very profound change in the way human beings live on this planet. It provides some tools for how to uh, marshal power, political power, by uh, being more strategically astute, by understanding who our allies might be, and better understanding why people oppose us and whether they're reachable or not. That can help shift the balance of power between those folks who are mobilizing around the world. To, to try to address climate change and those who are trying to stop that change. So, uh, so as a social scientist, the only tool I can bring to this challenge is knowledge. And, that's, and, and it's the knowledge I have in this case about worldviews that seems to be most valuable. Uh, whether it works or not, whether it can contribute to that kind of broader worldview tipping point and the political process that, I'm, that, I'm, uh, that I've talked about, I don't know, but it's, it's what I can contribute to that process at this point. Are there any examples in recent history that you can point to to support the idea that individuals and broader societies can jump from one worldview to another? 
through a process of some kind? So that, that's a marvelous question. And the short answer, uh, if, you, to, if, if you're talking about sharp worldview change, uh, where, where a lot of things reconfigure themselves in people's minds simultaneously, the short answer is no. Although we've seen, we've seen pretty significant worldview change on individual issues, such as uh, gay marriage, substantially around the world, uh, over, a sh over a relatively short period of time. Uh, over longer periods of time, uh, changes in uh, norms around the status of wom women, uh, uh, going back further, women's right to vote, uh, the, the uh, uh, shifts in attitudes about what is just and reasonable in warfare uh, have been encoded, of course, into, into laws. Those, that, those changes occurred largely through the 19th and 20th centuries, for instance, surrounding things like like uh, uh, use of poison gas and warfare and genocide, for example. There, was, there, there have been profound moral commitments and shifts in attitudes on these specific issues. But in this particular case, we're looking at something much more general, much broader. I think, and it's gonna be fundamentally keyed to our changing attitude of our, our relationship with nature, seeing human beings as embedded in natural systems rather than dominating and extracting from natural systems. And, uh, and, and, that's, and that is going to have consequences in all kinds of ways for the way we, we deal with each other and deal with the world around us. So it's a broader change. And the only other time, it's a broader almost cosmological shift we're looking for. And the only other time in history where we've seen something like that, uh, I would argue was a long time ago in a period of time, the, the uh, German existential philosopher, Karl Jaspers called the axial age. So that was between uh, uh, 600 BCE and 200 BCE, during which five major civilizations on the planet all changed their, uh, their basic understanding of reality, their, their kind of grounding uh, uh, set of assumptions or their cosmology simultaneously. And what was really interesting about that is that these societies weren't communicating a lot with each other at the time, and yet they all shifted simultaneously and it, according to Jaspers and other scholars, it laid the foundation for modernity, in, including monotheism within all of these civilizations. I think we may be on the cusp for something that you would call a second axial age. And there's some scholars who argue, uh, argue this case at the moment. We're in an extraordinarily unusual situation where we could see a really whole scale reconfiguration of, with the, with uh, the pandemic, you mean? With the pandemic, in part, but because the pandemic is only one manifestation of a whole range of challenges and, and stresses and shocks that humankinds are facing right now. In the book, I talk about about a, a dozen or more, and you you've mentioned them at the beginning, uh, and and uh, what these are doing in the pandemic really vividly reinforcing a, a, a sense of shared fate on this planet. So within a period of just a few weeks, uh, between mid-March and mid-April, uh, 4 billion people on the planet locked down. We've never seen in human history such a, such an, a shift in human behavior of such a large fraction of the human population so fast. That's un completely unprecedented. We, have, we are extraordinarily wired together and connected together around the planet now in a way that we never have been before. And we have scientific knowledge about the challenges we face. It means we understand what's going on with something like climate change. In a way, for instance, the civilizations during the Black Death uh, in the Middle Ages didn't understand. So, so uh, this, is a, this is an extraordinary situation. And we may be in a position for something that we, as I said, we could call a, a second axial age this time a global flip together of uh, attitudes about how we're going to live together on this planet, how we're going to live inside and embedded within nature. A tipping point that you just, as you described in the past. Well, I only have time for one more question before we go to audience questions and it's, it is related. I'm wondering, you have expressed concern in the past about the possibility that it is going to be extremists who benefit from a tipping point or a rupture like we might be experiencing now with the pandemic. How do we ensure that doesn't happen? And, and again, to use your words, to command hope in, in what could be a very uncertain period. I don't think we can ensure it doesn't happen. 
And that's uh, part of what I say at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book. It's, it's unfortunately, the situation now is such, given the stresses and disruptions we're seeing in people's lives around the world, and, the, and those are going to become worse uh, before anything starts to get better, given the trajectory we're on, uh, that uh, extremism is going to is going to be a factor and it's probably going to spread within societies around the world. So the question is not how do we prevent that from happening, but how do we contain it and how do we try to push back against it? So what is the other perspective, the other, the other worldview that will oppose uh, the Mad Max perspective in the way I set it up in the book? Uh, dominant worldviews or emerging worldviews don't don't emerge and sit in isolation. They tend to generate their antitheses, but we don't really know what the al the alternative is going to be. It hasn't coalesced around the world yet. What's what's the the progressive positive vision of the future? And so I spend the last part of the book trying to explain or describe what I think that is, grounded in a, a series of principles of of uh, security, opportunity, justice, and identity. And I talk in some detail about about each of those principles uh, as a starting point for thinking about what the uh, what I call renew the future worldview would be that will oppose the Mad Max worldview. Uh, because we need that if we're going to uh, uh, if we're going to have a response, an effective response to extremism, and also to fix the planet so that the underlying sources of disruption that are encouraging extremism are removed because that's essential. If we don't actually stop climate change, then extremism is going to get worse. So we need worldviews that will help us act on the problems at the same time as we they, they help us act against rising extremism. Since you raised that, I just wanna add one last follow. You were um, prescient in seeing far, uh, quite some time ago in the 90s and 2000s that that liberal democracy was not inevitable, that authoritarianism would rise with time. When you look at the landscape as it stands now, what do you see down in the future on the political front and in how we organize ourselves? Uh, I, I did anticipate, as you know, in both of my previous two books, The Ingenuity Gap and The Upside of Down, the situation we're in now. It's arrived a little bit sooner than I expected, I, I, I mentioned in Commanding Hope that I thought we would be where we are now sometime in the 2020s. Uh, I actually have less clarity for the future than I did uh, at that point for what is now the present. Uh, because I think the po range of possibilities opening up in front of us is absolutely enormous. So uh, and maybe this is a good way to conclude the interview, but I'm actually more hopeful after writing this book and I'm more hopeful in the context of the pandemic because of the way it's shocked people to start thinking about larger questions. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a disaster and a horrible situation for so many people around the world. But it's, it's, it's showed us that the way we're living on this planet and the way we've been pursuing our affairs together is not really working very well. And we're not gonna go back to the way things were one way or the other. Uh, and so what are we going to do to make things better going forward? I think, I think the range of possibilities for our individual societies like Canada and for the world uh, 10, 20, 30 years from now is absolutely enormous, much broader than it seemed back when I was writing The Ingenuity Gap in the late 1990s for the situation now. So the breaking apart of systems has started to happen. Uh, that's when things get exciting and very interesting and potentially providing real possibility for hope. Creativity, as you say. Thank you very much, Ted, for chatting with us. Thank you. So I'll quickly go to, uh, we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, here's one from, I, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, um, Erfan Fancy, I think is the name. Um, thinking outside the box is not so easy, but how could you have people have discussions on subjects like proportional representation or dying with dignity along with climate change? I think these questions all relate to issues of justice in part uh, and, uh, and to what extent we feel we are uh, responsible for each other's well-being. And uh, uh, I think climate change is, 
a profoundly intractable problem, uh, not because it's, it's, I mean, in part because developing the technology is a big challenge to, to move off uh, fossil fuel uh, transportation, for example, to uh, other, uh, to renewably powered transportation, but that's really not the real obstacle. The real obstacle is that climate change confronts us just as the pandemic has, just as dying with dignity has, just as the conversation around universal basic income has, it confronts us with extraordinary imbalances of power and wealth, not just within our societies, but especially between our societies on this planet. I mean, we have still somewhere around 40% of the world's population living on $5 a day or less. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think what's, it's, it's not a coincidence that all of the unrest surrounding Black Lives Matter, for instance, has risen to the surface during the pandemic. It's not a coincidence that the social justice conversations have, have become vivid and, and accentuated during the pandemic. It's because during the pandemic is 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 showing who's winning and Chad, can you hear me right now? So I think I think that um, it all relates uh, in very fundamental ways to uh, what ethics, what system of ethics we use to organize our societies. And that's a big conversation we're having right now. And it's heated and it's difficult. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure how it will turn out. Um, I express my own attitudes in the book about where I think it should go. But my sense is that's the way these issues connect together. Pat, I apologize. I think we lost you for a few seconds there, but um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna press forward, but just, um... Uh, just want to let you know that we lost you there for a minute, but uh, there's a question here from Renee Hetherington. Uh, she's, uh, I think it's a she says, Tad, you note that climate change is a complex system and that complex systems can suddenly change from one state of equi equilibrium to another. This is true and can be evidenced by Earth's climate history. You can stay, you can, you also state that today climate change is a negative thing that must be stopped. Yet, if climate change is a complex system that has existed on Earth throughout its history and has included shifts from intervals of it's a long question, a pervasive heat to extensive ice, and these changes have resulted in repeated extinctions of dormant species. What makes today different? And why should it not be normal for humanity to be the next dominant species to become extinct? Well, it's not normal because we're gonna be the first species to actually kill ourselves through climate, through by contributing to climate change. You know, the dinosaurs didn't do that. Um, uh, yes, the climate has always changed. And then these dramatic changes, uh, caused by comet impact or asteroid impact or changes in the Earth's orbital parameters, for example. Uh, but in this particular case, you have one species on the planet that in an extraordinarily short period of time is changing the composition of the atmosphere and its, transpar its uh, transparency to infrared radiation. That's uh, never happened before. It's especially bizarre since the species actually understands what it's doing and can't seem to stop it. Uh, so um, I think that makes the situations kind of sui generis and unusual, but it may be, you know, that we're just one in a long line of, uh, of failed species, but that's not where I'm prepared to go. As I said, Nala quoted my passage from the book, I'm not prepared to tell my kids that we're members of a failed species. I think human beings are, are better than that and can be more than that. So I don't think the story is finished yet the climate change story. There may be other kinds of climate change that happen that destroy us in the end, but I'd like to make sure that it's not one that we create ourselves. Um, thank you. Here's a, a reminder, you can put more questions if you have them in the Q&A function in uh, Zoom while you're listening. This is a question from Douglas West. Do you see hope in reconciliation with indigenous peoples and worldviews? Yes, I do. But I have to say that this is not it is not an area of great experience of mine, although I hope we, uh, within the research center that I'm now running on Vancouver Island called the Cascade Institute, that we're going to uh, uh, work with indigenous communities to understand what ideas and perspectives they can bring that will help us uh, cope with and perhaps respond to these challenges we face. 
Certainly, there are profoundly different attitudes towards nature and the relations between communities and nature in many indigenous worldviews. Um, but there's much more than that. And uh, I think that uh, much of this is not well understood by non-indigenous communities. So uh, this is a wealth of knowledge and ideas that can perhaps take us to a different place in that mindscape that I was talking about before, uh, that, that uh, most human beings perhaps have not actually visited a, a set of perspectives that could help us, as I said before, live together better on this planet. So I think indigenous communities have an enormous amount to teach us and tell us. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that they are bonding together around the world and increasingly speaking with one voice when it comes to the issue of climate change, which shows that they do share some uh, pretty fundamental convictions from their indigenous experience about uh, how we need to change our behavior on this planet. It's a question that sort of addresses a, a question I didn't get to, which is uh, from Julia Anderson. If you were advising Canadian politicians about how to commend hope beyond rhetoric and uh, an authentic, in an authentic way, what advice would you give? You know, I ask myself this question all the time. I, you know, if I were Justin Trudeau, if I were a a political leader, what would I be saying? And what and, and to what extent really what latitude would I have to to really move us onto a different pathway? And uh, and I I I've heard either personally and sort of through uh, personal conversations or from public commentary from many politicians over the year that the years that they can be very well motivated on critical issues. Uh, and want to make change, but they find that structurally they have virtually no room to maneuver. And that if they do make radical change, then they'll be ejected from office and, and won't have any possibility after that to make any change at all. I think, I think there are uh, moments of opportunity, and I think we're in one right now with the pandemic where we can actually shift. My sense is that the current federal government is, is thinking about major investment in green energies and green, green energy technologies and green infrastructure. That's the kind of thing that would have to be done. And this is unquestionably an opportune moment to do it. But my answer to the question is actually a little bit different. I think we need to give the politicians and the policymakers headroom to make these changes. In other words, uh, to the extent that the public uh, starts to shift and we're certainly seeing major shifts in attitudes, for instance, on the West Coast here in response to the evidence of climate change, for instance, the fires and the smoke. To the extent that, that the public says, starts to say, this has to be dealt with, and this is important, and now we need to move, then we provide the politicians with the structural opportunity, the, the room in which to make the major changes. And so that's where it comes back to the kind of ground war we can all engage in. We, in our own conversations, in our own communities, to start shifting people's perspectives on these issues, uh, rather than just uh, hoping that politicians will do it for us. Uh, related to that, um, the, there was a question earlier of, there was a time when the CIA and Al Gore and others were eager to hear your message. And the question is, <laughs> the question is, do you think they'll be eager to hear about the solutions you provide here now, or have they been, has there been interest? Well, <laughs> uh, yes, I spent a lot of time in Washington in the 1990s with my research team, uh, uh, advising them on uh, advising various divisions and components of the US government, the National Security Council, State Department, and the CIA on uh, the research we were doing on the relationship between environmental stress and violence, especially in poor countries. Uh, for instance, the extent to which demographic pressures contributed to the Rwandan genocide. Uh, the extent to which water conflict was uh, contributing to the, uh, to the crisis in, uh, between Israel and Palestine. Lots of studies, we did many studies. And there was a, a very substantial appetite during the Clinton-Gore administration for that information and that, that research. We, uh, I briefed Al Gore twice during the, uh, the Clinton-Gore administration. So no, I don't seem, I don't get that kind of receptivity now, not from the crew in Washington in, in, in power. And, and honestly, uh, the arguments I'm making in this latest book are less intended for policymakers. They're intended for each one of us as individuals and as family members, as community members, in the way I was just mentioning, the, the, that, that uh, they, they're tools that we can use immediately in our own lives 
to start being a little bit more empowered in our in our thinking about and our responses to these problems. And there are lots of people out there who tell you what you should do in, change, in terms of changing your consumption habits and things like that. And, and that, so that's, but uh, nobody is nobody, as far as I know, is given is giving you tools yet to think about how you can change the way you think. And uh, and 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 we all need that. As I point out in the book, I'm thinking about these things the wrong way a lot of times, and uh, and so that's where we can start. I, but I don't think that I'm going to get a huge amount of receptivity, even should the administration change in Washington at this point. I'm, uh, <laughs> my, my arguments don't speak to those folks uh, and their particular concerns so much. Uh, but one would expect the politicians should be interested. Um, in, in the meantime, here's another question from John Sears. Uh, what about faith traditions? Some have robust, energetic, self-sacrificial hope somewhere near their core. Do they constitute reclaimable, lasting, actionable, if difficult, wisdom? Yeah, absolutely. I love the way he, the sentence was constructed with the with all the adjectives. Uh, um, so in the state space model, one of the questions is, uh, uh, is reality fundamentally material or spiritual? Uh, when I've looked around the world at worldviews and political ideologies, I find one of the starting points, one of the key questions that they, they, uh, they either explicitly or implicitly address Um, Tad, if you can hear me, we've lost you again. I'll just wait to see if we can hear him again. My apologies. It seems either you've lost me or we've lost Tad. Um, can you confirm? Okay, it appears we've lost Tad. We'll just see if we can reconnect for those last few questions. Just give us a moment here. We do have a few more questions to get to. If you wanna hang in, we'll see if we can get Tad in there. To unmute myself. There what he did is. you hear? What did you hear last? We we didn't hear the answer to the question. So if, I'm glad you're back. So uh, here here we go. So if we could, uh, do you do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah. So well, it's about spirituality. Yes, and please I, I go just ahead. Said, yeah. And did you hear me say that I loved all the adjectives? Yes, you did say that. We heard that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you can say it again. It's a good question. No, no. But I, it's just it's just in my state space model. I have one question that's that's key at, right at the top of the list of questions, and it's you know is is reality fundamentally material or spiritual? Uh, and by spiritual, I mean not necessarily a religious notion of spirituality. Uh, and we can talk about what I mean, but I think we all have a rough understanding. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, a spiritual connection with reality is actually very important for people, for most people. And uh, any kind of uh, worldview around which we can coalesce that can give us a positive vision of the future needs to have a spiritual component. And I think religious communities and religious philosophies can provide us with an enormous amount of insight into what that spiritual component would look like. Uh, I tie it to what I call the rebuilding or, or the restoration of nature, not, not necessarily restoring it to the way it has been in the past. I think much that we will destroy will not be, will not be, uh, will not be able to return it to the way it was before, but we can provide as we move forward as a species more space for nature to flourish. And that can be a profoundly spiritual project because the complexity and creativity of nature is, is, is almost beyond imagination. And uh, I, I quote uh, Stuart Kaufman, the brilliant complexity theorist, when he says, that's God enough for me. But I, I think that there's room for uh, really important conversations about the role of spirituality and its emotional context in thinking about our positive vision of the future that's the object for our hope. Very final question before we wrap up here um, from Annalisa Loken, I think. As you mentioned, populism thrives on fear and many people seem to have given up on possibilities of creating change because of an emerging all or nothing approach as opposed to compromise. 
how do we reconcile to people who want an all or nothing approach that a middle ground that a middle ground is better than doing nothing so sometimes people go across that threshold and they are they become unreachable and uh, we just have to you know part of the exercise of understanding people's worldviews is to understand when they're unreachable and it doesn't make sense to invest a lot of energy in trying to convince them to change but there are other people who are wavering on that threshold or maybe it may be possible to bring them back the the, the there's a very critical uh, question that is also included in the state space that seems to be at the core of a lot of of this kind of decision and conversation, which is whether you regard human beings as fundamentally generous or uh, selfish, or in simplistic terms, whether they're basically good or bad. Most ideological perspectives start with a, a premise uh, on one side or other of that question. And uh, I would suggest that the best place to start if you want to reduce political polarization is to start with the premise that most people are reachable and are, and are and are in some basic sense good people and have the capacity to listen and think and respond positively and let them prove otherwise uh, if once you you reach out and try to engage with them but don't be surprised that there are going to be a lot of folks who have just gone too far and uh, i think we're seeing the proliferation of conspiracy groups like QAnon around the world that suggests that some people are now really trapped in their own epistemic worlds and can't be reached. Uh, the key challenge now is to make sure more and more people don't end up in those traps. Dr. Thomas Homer Dixon, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. And thank you very much to the, to the CIC as well and to everybody attending. Yes, uh, thank you so much. So on behalf of the, uh, the Waterloo branch of the CIC and the Victoria branches, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Homer Dixon and uh, Nala Ayed for this really engaging, um, enlightening, and, and challenging talk. I think uh, a true mark of, a, of an exceptional uh, talk is that there are more questions uh, left to be answered than that. that uh, there are more questions at the end than answers to be. So, again, hopefully we'll buy we'll buy the book. And, oh yes, and <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and let's let's please continue the the, the 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 discussion. So thank you so much again. We thank also our members. Um, and of course, we thank our, uh, our, 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 our executives as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.